So other than Ajahn, thank you. So brothers and sisters, you're now welcome to, to ask uh, questions, uh, providing comments or feedback to Tan Ajahn uh, for today's teachings or any other sessions in the past three weeks. Today is the last session, so this is the last uh, occasion uh, that we have uh, of uh, Tan Ajahn's uh, very precious time. Um, you know, being a bhikkhu, uh, plus being a very efficient and effective and very caring attendant monk uh, to a great teacher, La Fosumedo. So this is um, a, a time now uh, for you to um, interact with Tanajan. If you have a question, please feel free to click on the raise hand button and we'll invite you to unmute. So Tanajan, there's a question here. And the question is with regards to Sama Sankapa. Right aspirations. Uh, in the book, uh, Lampo has used right aspirations um, as uh, versus uh, other authors who have uh, other teachers who have used right right intentions. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit about this and how that could help us strengthen in our uh, Dharma practice? It's interesting to look at what the Buddha says defines as right, samasankapo. And it's the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-cruelty, and the intention of non-ill will. So it's really a way of inclining the mind. So it can be translated as either right aspiration, right intention, some of the older translations are right thought, but really it doesn't matter what the word is you use to describe that. If you understand what the Buddha means by samasankapu, by right intention, right aspiration. So sometimes these, uh, you notice they're all in terms of negatives. Renunciation is giving up. Non-ill will is basically metta, and non-cruelty is compassion, karuna. It's very interesting that the Buddha didn't actually say metta, like loving kindness and compassion, but he worded it in terms of what they're not. The first one is renunciation, so that's more on the generally understood as renunciation of material things. But not only, it also means renunciation of self-view, renunciation of attachments. And you can, you can uh, look at it in terms of desire as well, how this connects with how Samasankapo relates to desire. Because usually if we're operating in the world very much uh, attached to the senses, the six sense doors, but the five senses and the, of the body and in terms of the mind, we're usually, it's usually all about acquiring. I remember I always used to enjoy, even as a monk, I still enjoy moving from one dwelling to another, but even as a lay person, when I had to move from one flat, one apartment to another, it was always a great joy because I realized as I was packing my stuff, how much clutter I could accumulate. Stuff that I could notice how when I was living somewhere, I would open a cupboard, I would open a drawer, look at the stuff in the kitchen, you name it, look at it and say, is there anything right now that I'd get rid of? And it's like, well, yeah. I use the stuff, you know? But then when I had to actually put it all in boxes and move and move to a different flat, the trouble of all that stuff, I couldn't believe it. And I was so happy to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff and really thin down the amount of belongings, the amount of clutter I was schlepping around. And even as a monk, like in Thailand, we usually are in the tradition, forest tradition of Bocha monasteries, we're very much trained to have few belongings and a very helpful condition for that is that we live in a, in a hut in the forest 
and we have to move quite regularly every few months sometimes even every few weeks if there's some senior monks coming and we give up the dwelling for them to use and we move back in after they've left so you're having to grab everything you have and move out of there and i've been in some monasteries where people get very comfortable and live for a whole year in a hut in the forest and then when it's time to before the rainy season the dwellings are allocated in order of seniority and you look at the list and you go oh shoot there's someone moving into my kuti i gotta go move out and you grab your stuff and there's always more than you want and so you spend a day or two getting rid of stuff beforehand because you know what's coming so that when you move you can move quickly and lightly but i've seen some people go to their go to their back to their kutis with a cart and they're pushing a huge cart full of stuff around the forest and there's the alms bowl and there's their basic set of robes and there's a huge bag of books and they've got all kinds of other things on this cart. And sometimes they have to make two trips with the cart because one is not enough. So this is what we do as human beings. We tend to accumulate stuff. We like acquiring and we don't really give much thought to giving up, relinquishing. So this aspect of samasankapo, right, intention, to intend, again, coming back to this, this uh, definition of this uh, right effort, generating desire, endeavoring, striving, bringing up energy for the sake of renunciation. So how do we do that? Can I go back to my room after I've, we ended this Zoom session, look around my room and actually decide on one or two things I'll give up. If I don't ask myself the question this way, I'll leave the pens and pencils and papers and little stacks of post-its and cards or whatever it is that I have on my desk or on the chair, in the cupboard. But one good way of going about it is just looking at all of that and saying, how about I give up one thing today, just one thing. It's a very skillful way of just inclining the mind towards renunciation, saying, yeah, but what if I need it? Well, if I need it, I'll go and get it. It's okay. I don't have to keep it here where I feel safe that it's at hand, where I'm afraid if I give it up and take it back to the central stores in the monastery, maybe someone else will find it useful and take it away. And then, then what? Then when I need it, it's not there. Well, this is how we think. And this is all about acquiring, about wanting to feel safe and have what we need when we need it. And so what we're trying to do in cultivating renunciation is learning to give up these things. And so we can learn to examine our lives and look at what are the things that we like having, like acquiring, and learn to give up material objects, but then also habits. We like to have things our way because they make our lives easier. We can develop certain habits of doing things certain way, using certain things at home, at work. Going to the supermarket and always going down the aisles and everything exactly the same way for the last 10 years, because that's what makes us feel safe. We know where things are. We feel orientated, we feel okay and safe. Well, give it a change. And sort of notice these little habits that we have, and especially the habits that tend to generate uh, a sense of self when we're at home and we do certain things in a third certain area our way. Someone else comes and uses things and leaves them, uses it differently, puts it away differently, different cupboard, different shelf, different stacking. We use different utensils. I mean. In my kuti with Lumpur, I have uh, other people helping to upatak sometimes. And I can see in my mind how if I'm living with him, living there, then I have a sense of territoriality. This is, I have to live here and do things and you come here and you use that and you put it somewhere else or you use the one I like and I have to use some other thing and then I'm not accustomed to. And I can see all of that going on. And then how much suffering are we willing to create and go through wanting to have things exactly our way 
Or can we find a compromise and let go and say, does it really matter whether I get to do this my way or if I get it to do it someone else's way? So renunciation can all be, also be the renunciation of our views, of our preferences, of our desires, of our habits, of what makes us feel safe and secure. And you realize when you are willing, when we're willing to give these up, there's a little bit of a pinch in the heart when we give something up. But then there's a sense of freedom that comes from discovering that we actually are adaptable. And that adaptability gives us a lot less suffering, a lot more happiness than the things we usually try to bolt down and have safe so that it doesn't change and we feel happy because things are exactly the way we want them to be. And then in, in this spirit of renunciation, of giving up, the other two aspects of samasankapo, non-ill will and non-cruelty, are some very interesting things to watch. So we can develop metta, loving kindness, we can develop compassion, the sensitivity to suffering and how to allay our suffering, other people's suffering. But we're not always beautiful, inspired beings made of light and love. And in our interactions in life with other people, sometimes we can have some very selfish thoughts, some very nasty, petty states of mind arise. And when we're unhappy and the habit of operating from a sense of self that wants things to be this way and not wanting things to be another way, usually it's about preser preserving that and getting rid, preserving this and getting rid of that, destroying that. And this, these are the states of mind that lead to not being sensitive to anything else except outside of my world. When we're self-centered, when we're really focused on me and mine and how I want things and I want to be happy, we lose the, our, the sensitivity to others, what they are feeling, where they might be at, how they may be experiencing this situation. Because we're so focused on me and mine that there's not enough attention left to consider others. And that's where we can start behaving in, in ways that hurt others. We can lash out, and the intention is not necessarily to hurt others as much as to protect ourselves. But because the focus is our, ourselves, me and mine, it doesn't matter what happens to others. And if in the process they get hurt, well, tough luck for them, we shouldn't have come this close. And that is where we start behaving in way, ways that are cruel, and they are stemming from so much selfishness that anger, anger as a protective energy that protects me and mine, starts hurting others. So samasankapo being renunciation, non-ill will and non-cruelty is a way of becoming more aware of that. Being interested in how our reactions, our behavior, our speech, our ways of thinking sometimes can spill into ways of ill will and cruelty because we're so obsessed with self that we forget to be sensitive to how our behavior, our choices may be affecting others. So being interested in non-ill will, non-cruelty is also a way of, like with renunciation where we let go of self, is letting go of what I prefer and what I like and being sensitive to how our behavior may affect other people and making sure that it does not follow. If ill will or cruelty arises, then not to follow that. So it's really about giving up, relinquishing. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Damajan. Are there any more questions from the floor? Uh, yes, that's Karen. Karen has another question. Uh, Karen, uh, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Hi, Tana Jan. Um, sorry, I, I messed up the daylight saving. So I hope you didn't cover this part with this question, which I'm about to ask. Um, 
the word right um, for all the, the eight full noble paths um, has always uh, set a little bit uneasy with me. I'm just wondering whether you could shed some light. I mean, um, if Sankapo could have been redefined from right thought to right intention, is there another way of looking at the word right? Yes. It can, it can come across sometimes as a, a very peremptory, categorical way of saying this is right, that is wrong, and then it feels judgmental. It feels like we're defining good and evil, and it does, doesn't always feel right because it feels like we're making judgments, passing judgments on things. But it is just a word, and again, the, way, the same way Samasankapu can have different translations, uh, the word samma is mo most often translated as right, but it sometimes is translated as correct view. Or Lompo sometimes likes to, likes to use the word perfect. Perfect view, perfect intention, perfect speech. What, whatever these words are, samma, to take the Pali word, because it doesn't usually have these these uh, connotations that we have with other words that we use in English commonly. Some, uh, is a, it has a sense of, of uh, well-roundedness, of completion. Like it's the same Samma Sambuddha. Like when we go Namo Tassa, Samma Sambuddha. And the Samma really has a sense of roundness, of completeness. And so how is view well-rounded? How is intention well-rounded and complete? So you can look at that in those terms. For the sake of convenience of communication, it is easier to talk about right view, right action, right speech, right livelihood, right samadhi. But it is it's also important to realize that language is a convention and uh, we agree on a general usage of it. And then there are also a lot of cultural connotations that come with it. So use, you can change it to whatever works for you. But basically when you look at the Buddha's teaching, what he's pointing to, first noble truth is pointing to suffering. And what the purpose of his teaching is, is for the sake of the end of suffering. So in those terms, the Noble Eightfold Path, which leads to the end of suffering, are made as factors that contribute to the abandoning of suffering. So when we say right view and wrong view, really what is meant by that is the view that leads to more suffering or the view to lead that leads to the end of suffering. There's a, there's a sutta that I like to refer to, the Rahula Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha's teaching his son Rahula, who's a, a young novice, and uh, he's teaching him about how to examine one's behavior and how to purify one's behavior. And he's speaking about it in some very basic general terms. And the criteria for examining behavior and deciding what is worth following and what is not worth following in terms of behavior by speech, by body and mind is whether it is a cause for suffering for oneself, for others, for both, whether it leads to unpleasant results and undesirable consequences, then it's not to be followed. And if when we examine things, our behaviors in terms of body, actions by body, speech, and mind, and we see that it does not lead to, one's, to anybody's suffering, but it leads to beneficial and desirable results, then it's something that we can follow. So it's basically defining good and bad in terms of the results of our actions. What we call a good action or a bad action is not so much in terms of taking a position and judging an action, but in terms of appreciating the consequences of an action. And so language is, is, is a limb, we only got so many words to use 
to communicate things. So very often you'll find in the Buddha, in the Buddha's teachings, he takes a word that is usually understood in a certain way at, at his time, 26 centuries ago. And he says, what is a Brahmin, for example? In society in India, Brahmins were usually understood to be people from that caste of society who learn the three Vedas and who know how to do the ceremonies and they're above everybody else because they know so much better and they're so much purer and they come from this lineage and all of that. And he takes that as a word that kind of represents an archetype of what we hold as being the highest position in society. And he translates it to Dhamma and says, what is a real Brahmin? A real Brahmin is someone who knows reality for what it is, who knows the path of non-suffering and who knows the ending of suffering, who does not behave in any way that is detrimental to any other being. And he kind of takes a, a word that is commonly understood in one way, redefines it and gives it a new meaning in the light of the Dhamma of his teaching. So we need to learn to be able to recognize that and do that. And so when we, when we talk about the right view, the right factors of the path, notice, notice what comes up in the mind. And it's kind of like, hey, right, that sounds a bit uh, arrogant and judgmental and we know what's right and what's wrong and others don't. But also notice that that's just conditioning is what comes from our conditioning. But then in terms of how the Buddha is using the words, what is he actually pointing to? It's pointing to the way to the end of suffering. So what he calls right view, right effort, all the different right factors of the path are basically what lead to the end of suffering. So that's the, that's the measuring stick. Thank you, Tana Jan. Hey. Um, so, Tana Jan, we have uh, some questions here. Uh, perhaps let me invite Christine. Christine, can you please unmute yourself? Christine, um, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Tana Jan, I would like to ask questions. When uh, Dan Ajahn say that foundations on feelings, right? When we observe the feelings, we know when we are happy and when we are sad, the sad feelings come in. Is it the real intent of monitoring the feelings, right? Is to see that rise and seizes away of the feeling and realize the anicca and non-self? Okay, I hope I understood the question properly because there's a bit of wind in your microphone. Here, so it kind of, I'm not oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. How about now? Is it better? Oh, that was much better. Do you mind yeah. repeating? Please? Sure. Yeah. When uh, Dan Ajahn, you talk about the mindfulness on feelings, right? When I, I uh, when we know that when we are happy, yeah, uh, when we are sad, you know, all the, the unpressure things that come uh, to us that we feel sad and all this. My question is, by looking at this feeling, is it making us realizing that you know the rise and the cease away of the feeling that is anicca and also the non-self, or what is the op? Uh, the purpose of us, you know, by looking at the feelings. Yes, that is the purpose, because usually, I mean, there again, in terms of terminology is can be used differently. And uh, when general, in general way of speaking, when we talk about our feelings, it can be all kinds of things. But when the Buddha is talking about um, Vedana, he's talking, defining them more specific, specifically in terms of pleasant sensations, sukha vedana, unpleasant sensations, dukkha vedana, and then a category that's neither nor, called asukha, neutral sensations. And there they are aspects in our experience that always arise with any kind of contact. Everything we experience always has a component, an aspect of being either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And they are what we usually relate to in terms of being happy or sad. And so usually we relate to them in terms of self. I am happy, I'm sad, and we relate to them in terms of desire, like and dislike. 
So the Buddha, the reason the Buddha is pointing these out is to bring our awareness to the fact that usually what we're reacting to in life, what is what is uh, the motive force that directs a lot of our activities in life is like and dislike. If we like it, like it we either try to bring it close or go to it. If we dislike it, we try to put some distance between us and it, whatever it is. It can be physical things or it can be emotions, trying to get rid of emotions we, that are uncomfortable, trying to extend those that we enjoy. So what the Buddha is pointing to is that before like or dislike arises, which is a reaction to these sensations, well, to notice these sensations, they arise as they are, and we can't help. They are conditioned, so we don't all experience the same things as being pleasant or unpleasant, some yes, some no. But just to notice how in, ex in our experience, this aspect of a pleasant sensation or an unpleasant sensation, or just notice that there's neither nor, some, some sensations are neither pleasant nor unpleasant, but to actually pay attention to them. And the, the, the purpose of doing this is, first of all, to notice that this is happening, because usually we move straight on to reacting to them, liking, disliking, and then operating from there. So if we backtrack and start paying attention to the fact that, oh, right now, sitting like this is sitting here for now almost two hours. By now, the body generally feels still feels okay, so it's pleasant or it's unpleasant, I'm really sort of achy and restless and want to just move. Or it can be a combination of the two, or it can be neither or. We can be sitting here and it doesn't, it's not particularly pleasant. I wouldn't say right now it's pleasant, but you also can say, well, it's not particularly unpleasant. And so that's that third category of neutral. And what's really interesting about paying attention to these and really kind of bringing awareness to this aspect of experience is to notice how we usually move straight on to reacting to them out of desire and from this point of view that is self. I like, I dislike, or I ignore and that when it's neutral. We can be sitting with a neutral, the body feeling completely unremarkable and the state of mind being completely unremarkable. But because we're not appreciating it, appreciating it as being just that, it's not a sensation of happiness. It's not a sensation. It's not an unpleasant sensation either. It's just meh, kind of nothing special about it. And if we're not paying attention to it, then usually our reaction to that is not neither, dis, neither like or dislike, but boredom. And we're looking for something to stimulate the mind, something that will kind of make the lights flash either on the side of liking or on the side of getting away. It's almost, we almost feel like something uninteresting. And there's something wrong because we're not being stimulated. We're not being excited. And we do, don't usually just appreciate the neutral sensation for being something quite peaceful, actually. So usually if we start, if we start watching these, we see how we are very often excited and disturbed by pleasant and unpleasant sensations and then the quest to get more of it or get rid of it. It makes for a very, very busy life reacting to these all the time and ignoring the fact that in a large, large part of our sensations may be unremarkable, just neutral and actually peaceful. So paying attention to Vedana, to these sensations, pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, and neutral ones is very enlightening as a reference from which we can look at our experience. And it, it'll help reveal when it is that we fall for the trap of grasping and desire and making, looking at things and responding, reacting to things in terms of self. And when we come back to this, it's just a sensation. And we don't have to follow the reaction that arises. We can just stay with the sensation, let the reaction pass, and just stay with the sensation and take it, an interest in it, see how long it lasts, how strong the reaction is that comes up or not so strong, and investigate. So it helps us step 
away from this habitual sense of self and the habitual response coming from desire. Thank you, Tanajan. So Tanajan, we have time for one last question. Can I please uh, invite um, someone with the phone number uh, Lenovo Tap M10 to unmute, please. And if you can turn on your video, it will be very helpful. Hello, Ajahn. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question is, when you talk about renouncing, so to what extent are we supposed to renounce? Because uh, I've experienced it that when we tend to renounce, people try to take advantage of us. So shouldn't we fight till the end if it's the truth? Or should we let people take advantage of us? <laughs> no, you don't need to let people take advantage of you. But uh, letting go, renunciation, same as generosity, which is basically two ways of looking at the same thing very often. It needs to be guided by wisdom. So understanding what you are able to renounce is important. Some people are able to give everything up. Other people cannot do that because like simply in terms of family, if you have uh, duties and your responsibilities with a family, maybe it's you cannot. It's not, it's not the right time to give everything up and walk away from it. But then also that depends on your situation, of your understanding, of your life, your experience, and your practice. In terms of generosity, is the same thing when we're giving. Like you can look at there's some very beautiful guidelines, and I think it's the last. Sutta in the, in the Dika Nikaya, where the Buddha is uh, just laying down many different principles to help lay people guide themselves in life, in many aspects of their lives, in relationships to their husbands and wives and children and parents and uh, co-workers and bosses and employees. And how to, one of, one of the aspects is uh, how to relate to one's um, money, fortune, whatever that is, and how to divide it into four, I forgot if it's three or four uh, categories, what you need to look, to look after your and your family's current needs. One portion you put aside for the future to make sure that there's enough there to function without uh, running into difficulties down the line. The third portion you keep for your personal enjoyment and then a fourth person, a portion you give away. And he doesn't tell you what the percentage is or anything like that. He doesn't say 10% is for this and 25 for that or anything like that. It's really for us to learn to develop the wisdom and understanding according to these circumstances and conditions that we are in, what can we do? So in terms of generosity, how much if people are, that's kind of the, the great blessing of people who are extremely wealthy is they have a lot of money to give away if they're willing to. And if they see the benefit in that, they can do an incredible amount of good because they have gobs of money. Someone who's extremely poor and who lives from hand to mouth doesn't have much to give away. It doesn't mean they cannot practice generosity, but the means will be different. So the understanding of the situation and circumstances are different and that, that will inform the decisions that are made. In terms of renunciation, generosity is a form of renunciation, giving up what I have for the sake of helping someone else. But then sometimes we can just give up something and we're not necessarily giving it, giving it to someone else for their benefit as much as giving it up for our own benefit with the benefit of letting go, letting go of something that we find ourselves attached to. And then again, we need to learn to do that in ways that allow us to function properly, that are in uh, balanced in our lives. And again, there's not a hard answer to that one either, because if you look at one of the Bodhisattva's last lives, when he was this King Vizantara, and he was perfecting Dana Parami. He gave away the 
royal white elephant, which was a source of great prosperity to the country. And of course, for him in terms of practicing generosity and relinquishment, and it was a great step forward as a king to give up something that's seen as the source of prosperity for your kingdom. He gave up his, he gave up, he relinquished his possessions. He gave away his children. He even gave away his wife. And in our, in our usual way of looking at this, you think you must be completely nuts to give that kind of stuff away. I mean, who gives away their wives and children? Some sort of psychopath or something. And so again, these choices are informed by the wisdom that we are bringing to the situation, the context in which it is done. So wisdom is a very, very important aspect in deciding what you are giving away, what you are relinquishing. And it's important to do it in a way that works for you and for the people around you. I hope that's helpful as an answer. Yes, thank you, Tana Jan. Um, it's been it's been a wonderful uh, four weekends, and uh, it's uh, we all feel very blessed uh, by your wise words, your calm demeanor, and your skillful practice, uh, Tana Jan. In the last uh, four weekends. Many of us have come to know you a lot, lot better, uh, particularly from the articulation of um, the Four Noble Truths. Um, it's been wonderful having you here with us. Um, and may, may I please invite you to perhaps uh, say a few words uh, in terms of closing remarks as we close this uh, series of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, so as to guide all of us uh, as we reflect upon the, your, the teachings and the teachings of the Buddha and Lampo Sumedho on how we can strengthen our practice. Um, hmm. Well, I'd encourage you to memorize what these Four Noble Truths are. They're described as Four Noble Truths, each one with three aspects. And then each of these uh, Four Noble Truths can be described in further and further detail. I encourage you to take an interest in that and try to memorize at least the basics. And then if you're interested in memorizing some more, just what the Buddha taught, what is it that he taught? So that's if anybody came to you and asked you, what are the Four Noble Truths? What are they? At least from a theoretical point of view, you can answer that question. And the benefit of that is that once you have that in your memory, that's that first level of wisdom that I was talking about, the theoretical knowledge. Then you can use that at any given point in time. You can use that to start examining your experience. How does my experience here and now in my life relate to that? How can I learn to look at what I'm experiencing in terms of the Buddha's teachings? And it's very beneficial to be able to do that so that you don't always have to turn to a book turns to YouTube, a teaching, or actually go to the monastery to see a monk every time you feel like you need help. You can actually start to help yourself. We'll always use, we'll always benefit from having the guidance of people who are further down the path from us, but it's extremely helpful to be able to start to use the Dhamma inside our own hearts. And it starts with memorizing a few basics. Well, that's what I would encourage you to all do. And then to trust and nourish this interest and this sense of curiosity that will, uh, that will help you investigate your experience, investigate discontent, suffering, and really be curious about it. And don't stop, stop asking questions about your lives, about the Dhamma, about how it works and how it applies. I think I don't need to really say much more than that, because if you follow these, you'll find that uh, you can go a long way just by yourselves, by having a basic map of the land and then striking out and investigating and discovering. And it's fun. So that would be my encouragement. Andamayam dhammagataya sadhu karam dhammasay 
Sadhu, 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 Anumodami. Friends, uh, let's pay our respects to Arjan with three bows. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. I'd also like to thank the organizers of these four sessions. I found them very enjoyable. And it's been a pleasure that you've all attended. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tenor John. The, open, the, the, the invitation is open to you for a lifelong of teaching. As long as you have the time and strengths, we would like to invite you back into the session again. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK. <laughs> Right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.